Hello everyone. You're all very welcome to our webinar this evening. I'm going to let everybody in there so that we have a chance to make sure that everyone can get in before we get ready to go. It's one of the features of Zoom webinar that everybody just needs a chance to get in before we get started. So I hope you're all warm wherever you are this evening. I cycled home this evening and it was freezing on the way. So I hope wherever you are that you're warm and cozy. Okay, and it looks like we have everybody here now, I think. Sorry, I see the camera just switched off there. Um, okay, I think we are good to go. So first of all, hello everybody. You're all very welcome to this evening's Positive Economics webinar. And when it came to choosing the title for this one, it wasn't very difficult. It is the story of 2022, namely inflation. No matter where you go, whether it's the World Economic Forum, whether it's the conversation that's had uh, at any street corner, whether it is government policy, whether it is wage negotiations, whether it is the Christmas bonus, no matter what we're talking about these days, a lot of it comes back to inflation. So what I thought would be a good idea this evening is to take us through a real deep dive into it and to get an understanding of everything to do with what's going on in inflation in general. I'm going to share my screen in a moment and I'll walk you through the key things that I'm going to cover today. But before I do that, just to give you a broad outline, what I'm going to focus on is, first of all, looking at where inflation comes from and then looking at Irish inflation in particular. So what is driving Irish price increases and what does that mean in reality, in real terms? When it comes to your shopping bill, whether it comes to your gas or electricity bill, uh, whether it comes to the cost of education, all those sorts of things, what does this really mean? as an old saying would say in pounds, shillings and pence or euros and cents today. Yeah. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare Irish inflation with the world. So I'll then show you what's going on with the major countries around the world and to show you how Ireland compares, but also not just how inflation may be dealt with in Ireland, but also how are different countries handling it throughout as well. And then the last thing I'm going to do is look at inflation expectations going into the future. So where do we expect this to go? Where do we expect this to go? Has inflation peaked? Are we expecting <clears throat> further increases? And of course, how are governments, central banks and other parties handling this as well? So that's broadly speaking, what we will be doing over the next uh, under an hour. And before we get to that, uh, please do, of course, feel free to put your questions into the Q&A pod. I'll see them there. I'll answer as many as I can in the time that I have. And also, of course, if you'd like to chat, you can uh, feel free to pop it in there as well. As you know, this will be recorded and it, it is being recorded and will be available afterwards. Everybody who has registered here uh, will get the follow up email. And for those of you who have uh, told us that you would like to be added to our mailing list, you will also be the first to hear about the next positive economics webinar. OK, so before we get to that point, um, what I just wanted to do is. I just want to talk about in positive economics, I just want to talk about what it's like to actually write a chapter to do with the price level. So in the textbook itself, it is, uh, we talk about inflation law, particularly under chapter 14, monetary policy and the price level. Now, when you're writing a chapter around inflation at the time that the three of us were as authors, inflation in Ireland, like it wasn't there. It simply wasn't there. We were looking at inflation from the point of view of, of course, as lots of people know, that the objective of the European Central Bank is across the euro level or across the euro area to keep the price level uh, growth at or below 2%. That is the objective of the ECB. Now, when we were writing this book, and in fact, when we were writing the book before it, in both cases, inflation was really, really, really low and had been for a decade. You think about it, the euro was only 20 years old and therefore monetary policy to be created and implemented right across the eurozone is, of course, only 20 years old as well. So for the past roundabout, since roundabout 2010, the ECB has been dealing with extremely low inflation. 
And the, they use the monetary policy tools, again, that we mentioned in here, around lowering interest rates and increasing money supply and doing what they could around the exchange rate and a variety of subset of tools throughout. And then things changed last year. Things really changed last year because last year inflation started to be seen in various different developed economies around the world. Central bankers, like from the Fed in the US, started talking about this transitory form of inflation, which means it was only going to be here for a little while. We were going to see transitory inflation, and that had happened as a result of a really bizarre economic situation because of COVID, uh, bizarre supply chain issues that had happened because factories couldn't open and it was a Suez Canal issue and all sorts of other things. Also, of course, just remember that the marginal propensity to consume is particularly high when you are dealing with people who have got stretched economic resources, namely income. So as the government was providing a lot of support into the fiscal economy, into people's pockets directly, then people were spending the money as they were getting it. And in some cases, of course, they were also saving it. And then you had a backlog of money that was going to reach the economy as soon as lockdowns were lifted. All these reasons were going to lead to transitory inflation. And then the word transitory started to be dropped from the conversation as we got to the end of last year. And actually it was like, well, maybe it's not transitory after all. And then of course, the really big thing happened at the beginning of this year. And that was the invasion into Ukraine. And then, then things started changing completely because then it wasn't just about the price of generally goods and services rising. Instead, then it became a real, real laser focus on energy. And then from there, all of 2022, we have been talking about the rise of gas prices, the rise of oil prices. And I'm going to show you the real figures around those. And as I say, we take a deep dive. Then we were also focusing on the increase in the price of food. And I was speaking for a group in May, um, people who are working in the banking sector. And of course, like I say, inflation as an economist, unless you were talking about inflation this year, you weren't talking about anything relevant. But at the time, I was saying, in particular, what was going to have to happen next was going to have to be a conversation about wages. Is that if you're going to have a rise in the cost of living, well, then that's going to be fed into wage negotiations, whether it's at an industrial level through a trade union, whether it's one to one conversation in small businesses, whether it's overall conversations around this with larger companies, whether it's government deals, no matter what, wages was going to have to be looked at from the point of view of the cost of living. And more and more, of course, we're seeing those conversations now making it into the news. You're hearing it now coming up again in how, um, how Christmas bonuses are being administered. And one of the things the government did in that regard is I have my own company. I also have staff. And last year, I could give any member of staff a 500 euro tax-free um, voucher in Ireland. So I could have bought, which we did, <laughs> but buying a 500 euro voucher for a staff member and then they could get that tax free. This year, for example, the government has lifted that tax free level up to a thousand euro. So now a company can buy a thousand euro voucher, for example, for their staff to be given out. So that's a way, that's a, obviously a short term, once off uh, measure that can happen for, between an employer and an employee. Obviously, what happens with wages, et cetera, happens thereafter. But more and more, we're seeing that being fed into the conversation now as well. So on that note, I am now going to share my screen. And I am going to make sure, first of all, that my slides are open, which they are. And here we go. Okay. So what I'm going to start off with talking about is where does inflation come from? What is the Irish inflation rate at the moment? What is driving Irish inflation? Uh, how does Ireland compare to the rest of the world? What are different countries doing about inflation and what are inflation expectations in the future? So let's take it from the top. Where does it come from? Now, in here, we talk about demand, um, cost push and demand pull. And for anybody that's looking at the book there directly, 
I had come up with a picture brief at that stage um, where I felt a good analogy for thinking about this is, is when you pull a door and push a door. So I'm going to take a different picture here tonight. This one comes from Investopedia. And if I just look at the middle one first, so we've got cost push inflation. So this is where, let's say that I have, I've got a phone here in front of me. And when I look at that phone, of course, it's made up of a range of, of things. It's made up of a range of bits and pieces. It's made up of software that has been put onto it. It's made up of hardware. And of course, you've got the packaging around it. In order to sell it to me, you have the person in the shop who is going to be telling me about its features and dealing with my questions, etc. And then after that, also a charger comes with it. Okay, so let's just say they're all the things to do with a phone. However, if those, if the things in the phone go up in price, well, then the company selling me the phone is going to either have to do one of two things, either absorb those cost increases. If they do, that will affect their profit or else pass it on to me. In other words, push up the prices thereafter. So what would happen in that regard is I feel the inflation. The inflation, first of all, happens as the company is making the phone. But since the price rises, then I'm also experiencing inflation. So that's costs, cost push. That means because costs are going up, well, then the price of good goes up, which means that I feel the increase in the price, namely inflation. But let's go over here to demand pull. So demand pull is actually uh, where I would more so, where I'm going to more so focus our, our energy tonight, energy being a pun actually based on what we're going to be talking about. And that is, imagine that there's X amount of things available. So there's a fixed amount of things available, but more and more and more and more people want those. Now, I'm somebody that was only delighted to go and see Garth Brooks uh, as a musician when he came to Ireland a couple of weeks ago and was playing in Croke Park. So I was one of those people who was only delighted to go down to the concert down in Croke Park. However, if there was far more people wanted to go and see Garth Brooks than actually uh, spaces available, well, then there may have been an increase in the price. Now, at the time, Garth Brooks actually maintains the price of those concert tickets, the same as what when was supposed to happen in 2014. So they were fixed. But let's just say instead that the concert was totally sold out and somebody wanted a ticket. And let's say they were looking at some sort of informal market. Maybe it was eBay or another market environment. Then you can see the price is going up. I was in Croke Park again last Sunday for the All-Ireland or the Leinster um, Senior Hurling and Football Club Finals. I have been in Croke Park on many occasions over the past couple of years. And that the bigger the occasion, so if it goes to the quarterfinal, then the semi-final, then the final itself, the prices of the tickets go up because more and more people want to buy them. However, let's just think about that in the context of the moment of energy. When you look at where we're getting our energy, something has changed significantly in the past year. And I want to draw your attention to one particular statistic that was mentioned by Ursula van der Leyen in the State of the Union Address 2022. I am going to show you what that is right now. This is the State of the Union Address which uh, came from uh, Ursula van der Leyen, like I say, and I'm just going to control F and I'm going to look at the number 9%. She said here, last year, Russian gas accounted for 40% of our gas imports. Today, it's down to 9% of pipeline gas. So the thing is, is that what the amount that is actually available to us as a result of what's happened in the Ukraine has reduced. Has the demand for gas or oil decreased? Well. Back when COVID was at the very beginning, there was an expectation that there would be a global slowdown in demand because it was such a shock to the economy. And before we started seeing governments back businesses or governments um, enable people to maintain employment while companies were shut down, etc. At that stage, it was a really big fear that there was going to be a massive global recession super quick and for, long, and for a long time. And that didn't materialize. So as a result, demand has actually remained the same. So what we're seeing is a demand pull inflation, but actually it's not because demand necessarily has been increased, like lots more people want to see Garth Brooks or lots more people want to go to Croke Park for a GA match, is that instead it's because the amount that we're actually importing from Russia has dramatically decreased. And of course, you can't just switch on green energy resources super quick. You can't just say, okay, do what we'll do now. We'll build a load of solar panels all over the place, or we'll build a load of wind farms out in the Atlantic. 
Of course, they are planning all of these things to happen. And we could talk about green energy production in another day. But the point is, is that demand pull inflation is what's really driving the bus here. Because we've got a big demand, but our access to that energy has changed because of what we've seen in the European Union continent this year. And then, of course, the other one is the one that I started to allude to. And that is that now what we're going to start seeing is built in inflation. And that is when prices rise, well, then the expectation for wages rise as well. So what happens then is that as people are earning more, then they can fuel that. And again, that's another pun, then they can fuel that. Now, of course, that doesn't mean to say that every employer will give wage increases. <laughs> Nor does it mean that when a trade union is negotiating a wage increase, that that can actually, that that, that agreement will be met on both sides. We can't just assume that these will happen and it will be smooth. But the point is, is that that element of wages responding to cost price increases has to feed through to the economy. And if it doesn't, you may say it doesn't have to, Susan. OK, no, you're right. It doesn't have to. But what happens if it doesn't? Well, what happens is, is that real incomes fall, is that inflation adjusted incomes fall. And then we have a separate knock on effect. And that is where people can't afford to buy as much as they used to. They're, so their marginal propensity to consume remains high, but the amount of money that they can actually spend changes. Then that has a knock-on effect. First of all, it's consumer discretionary. Those cyclical elements of the economy start to suffer. That could be um, hospitality. That could be more expensive items, whether they might be cars, whether, again, going back to holidays and hospitality, could be clothes, could be food at a higher end and all those sorts of things. And that then continues. And then it starts in, then it starts to affect other areas of the economy. And we all know what can happen from there. Then we are dealing with a downward spiral. So that's why, as a result of that, when it comes to wages, this is where, this is the, the both the public and the pri private sector address this from the point of view of wages. And that is one way in which inflation is actually not tackled as in slowed down, but actually enabling people to keep up with it. So that's how inflation works at a theoretical level. But let's now look at the Irish inflation level. I got this from the latest CSO press release and it basically summarizes where we're at at the moment. <coughs> the consumer price index rose by 9.2% between October 2021 and October 2022, up from an annual increase of 8.2% in the 12 months to September 2022. So therefore we can see that as regards the latest figures in October, the CPI had continued to rise. By the way, later on in the session, I'm gonna to talk to you about the difference between the CPI and the harmonized rate of inflation as well. I just want to explain the difference between the two because that could come up again and again. But I thought the second statistic here is quite interesting. This is the 13th straight month where annual increases of the consumer price index has been at least 5%. Now, what is not here, what I haven't said, is this is the 13th straight month, straight month of inflation. I haven't said that. I said of greater, at least 5%. So if I was to turn that into real figures, and in the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about pounds, shillings, and pence, what this actually means in reality, in one's pocket as they're shopping. What this means is that at any stage over the past 13 months, and this is going back to uh, September 2021, at any stage over that time frame, when you would compare to a month before, or sorry, a year before, the same month, a year before, whatever cost 100 euros then costs 105 now. But because this is the consumer price index, this refers to a basket of goods. And as I promised, and as the title suggests, we are going to do a deep dive. So I'm going to show you exactly what has been driving those increases and also what has been decreasing in price as well. So uh, I thought this was a, a particularly interesting um, real life scenario. And this is the national average price. This comes also from the CSO. And they looked at like the national average price for bread, right? So 800 gram uh, sliced pan was up 20 was up 26 cents. Uh, now I actually should make this slide a easier to read. 
So let me go and do that because I don't want us now missing out on anything. Uh, so I'm going to get this. This is design happening here now on the fly. But we can just get this and I'm going to crop it and I'm going to pull it out here to the right. If that ever happens to you, by the way, that's all you need to do is just change the crop. Okay. And the other thing that I need to do is increase decrease the size, change the crop again. Sorry, you're getting a digital skills lesson here now as well as everything else. Okay, now I'm going to leave that there and now move to the top. Okay, but much better. Like I say, digital skills as well as everything else tonight. Okay. So the national average price for bread was up 26 cents in the year to October 2022, while the same size brown slice pan was up 24 cents in, in the year. Spaghetti, 500 grams increased 28 cents, while the average price of two and a half kilogram of potatoes decreased by six. Full fat milk and so on, you can see from there. So there was genuinely differences in, in those stable items. And they are not necessarily items that uh, households can compromise on or get, get fewer of, obviously, if you want to feed your family. Similarly, when you look at a can of lager, when you look at cider, when you look at the price of a pint, when you look at uh, full fat milk, etc. Now, all of the, the top three, all of those refer to just the changes that are happening on a price by price basis in reality. And this is the thing I will say to all of you, because I know we've got both students and teachers here tonight is that as, as a student of this, of this area, let me just tell you something that a lot of people say to economists, is that a lot of the time economists speak in like high level figures. We talk about growth of an economy and like the Irish economy is hundreds of billions. Or we talk about full employment, two and a half million people in employment. Or we talk about the impact, the, the cost of child benefit to the, to the government. Or we talk about a change in pension age and what that's gonna do over a period of time is that often economists, we talk in big figures, but in reality, economics affects one person after another. And it's really important when you're talking to people about the economy, is that you understand where, we're look, where one person is looking at their economy. And as you know, um, I have the name of the positive economist, and that's not to say that I always just talk about good stuff. Often people think that, it doesn't mean that at all. It means that instead I always try to look through the lens of a person, a business, a sector, a organization through their world and simply look at what they can do with the economic situation that they're looking at so that they can improve it. So when it comes to understanding inflation, it is important to look at an individual element an individual cost of something that everybody buys, like, or most households might buy, like a loaf of bread, like a packet of spaghetti, etc. So now that we've looked at the more granular level in pounds, shillings and pence, or again, euros and cents, let's now move up the level and look at this on an overall basis. Because there's two slides I have here, and this is just a summary of the latest CSO release, CSO being Central Statistics Office. Now it's a pretty long release, and I just want to speak out a couple of things. Number one, we have got the highest rate of inflation since June 1984. I let you in on a secret. I wasn't born then. I wasn't even born in June 1984. In other words, I am seeing higher inflation out than at any stage of my lifetime. Even the earlier parts when I have to say I wasn't a student of economics. So this is the highest rate of inflation since June 1984, when inflation was 9.7%. And it follows an increase of 8.2% in the year to September 2022. And of course, then you can see there, prices have been rising on an annual basis since April 2021. Remember when we were hearing about transitory um, inflation and now an annual inflation of 5% or more recorded in each month since October 2021. And I should say now, actually, because I had said there was since September, October is 13 months because of course you have the two October, so that would have been 13 months. So we are like, this is history bearing out in front of us. And I remember one day walking into um, a meeting in a company in Dublin. And as I walked in, the front page of the newspaper of the Financial Times, and I'm going to show you something on the FT here in a little while, but the front page screamed this big inflation, this big headline that said inflation in the UK is now down, down, is now down to 10%. And I just said, oh my God, that is 
like to think that inflation was down to double digit figures still and that that was being hailed as okay maybe it's turning around so there's one for you is that we're seeing the highest rate of inflation in 38 years and there you go you have the numbers now what's driving it let's actually look because we looked at cost push we looked at demand pull and then there's built in but and there's also one other element that i want to talk to you about as well but we we'll get to that so where is it coming from? Okay, so the most significant increases in the year were seen in housing, water, electricity, gas, <clears throat> and other fuels. And th that was up by 27.8%. And then there's food and non-alcoholic beverages, which rose by 10.6%. So increased energy costs. Now, what's that called? Cost push inflation. In the yearly increase in housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels is up 71% in electricity. 71%. So in reality, from my point of view, let's say as a business, from my point of view, if I am experiencing higher costs of electricity, gas, heating, or any of those energy sources, I am experiencing those. And therefore, I then am going to have to go to my customers and either increase prices or alternatively, I need to absorb it into my profit margin. Uh, if let's say I'm having super normal profit, this is going to affect it. If it's normal profit, it's still going to affect it. However, who's providing me with the electricity? Well, it's going to be an electricity provider. They're just, they're experiencing demand pull. It's because they're trying to find more electricity and the source of where they're getting it has changed as a result of what I just showed you there from Ursula, Ursula van der Leyen. So our experience of inflation is the same, which is higher costs. But the reason for our inflation may be different. So you can see here, gas is up 93.3%. That is unbelievable. That's nearly double. Liquid fuels or home heating oil is up 65.4%. And then solid fuels is up 47% in the year. So then the annual changes in food and non-alcoholic beverages costs uh, reflect a rise in prices across a range of pro pro uh, products. Fresh oil milk, showed you that already. Butter, 19.3%. Eggs, 17%. And bread, 16%. So is it all, is everything increasing all the time? Mm, okay, now down here then I want to bring you the third point, which is there was a decrease in education, minus 6% in the month to September, 2022. But of course, if as an economist, it's really important to have a curious mind. So you wouldn't stop there. You'd say, okay, but where's that coming from? Like, what is the cost of it, of education? Because I'm sure a lot of people might say, well, the cost of books has gone up. Cost of pens, paper might have gone up. Cost of public transport to get people to school or college has gone up. Actually, <clears throat> it is due to a reduction in costs associating with participating in third level education. So therefore, people in secondary school, primary school or um, play school may not be seeing this. It's more so re related to the costs associated with participating in third level education, particularly driven by fees. The second slide that I wanted to show you from that longer press release is this. <clears throat> Here is where they actually point out where this is driven by. So housing, water, et cetera, rose mainly due to an increase in the cost of electricity, gas, et cetera, and mortgage interest repayments. Now, can I just draw your attention to this here? Mortgage interest, oh, mortgage interest repayments. I want to draw your attention to that for two reasons. Number one is it's going to appear on the next slide as you're going to see when we get on to the next slide. But the other reason that I wanted to remind you of this is what we're going to look at in a little while is how central banks are handling inflation. And one of the things that central banks are doing is they're raising interest rates. Now, if you increase interest rates, think about the knock-on effects of that. If you increase interest rates, well, then you're increasing the cost of borrowing. And why would people borrow money? Well, one of the key reasons is to pay for a house. That's called a mortgage. So the thing is, is that increasing interest rates in the short term is itself inflationary, even though it's due, it's supposed to have the, the opposite effect. Now, I'll explain in a little while <clears throat> why interest rates go up in order to deal with this. But in the short term, if you increase interest rates, you're increasing the cost of repaying debt. If you have a variable mortgage, if you have a variable mortgage, well, then as a result, you have to pay a higher amount on your mortgage to repay and to service that debt, which itself is inflationary. You may say, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, why would central banks do something to increase inflation when inflation is already high? We'll talk about that. Second one here, transport, of course, 
it's due, it's a knock on effect of the other one, due to a rise in the price for cars, diesel, petrol, etc. As well as, of course, public transport. So, what does the government do in this situation? Well, what it tries to do or seeks to do is to then intervene in the price of public transport and then subsidize some of them. I got um, I got on Dublin bus the other day and I was uh, I was going out to see my husband's cousin and his wife and as I got on the bus I was just googling um I was just I was I was going on to google maps to see exactly where I needed to get from A to B and I also just uh, out of pure interest was looking at the price and the price I could see had, was actually lower than I A I had thought and B than when I had been on a bus before that in a similar scenario so, of course, that is because the government is intervening here in order to deal with uh, public transport. And that is a fiscal mechanism then, as distinct to a monetary policy mechanism. A fiscal mechanism is one that is to do with taxes and spending. So then we have here food and alcoholic beverages rose due to higher prices. And again, we've already had a look at those. The ones that we didn't mention were cereals and vegetables. Now, if you want an even deeper dive than what I'm going to do with you, <clears throat> if you go on to this latest CSO release, there are tables for every single element of inflation, and you can see exactly where the biggest ones are coming from. I've summarized them here for you, but it's a good exercise just to go in and see exactly where it's been driven from. Restaurants and hotels increased mainly due to increased prices for alcoholic drinks and food consumed in licensed premises, restaurants, cafes, and an increase in the cost of hotel accommodation. Also, of course, as you're going to see an increase in wages for hospitality staff, that, of course, too will then um, enable those hospitality staff to handle the inflation they themselves are experiencing. And then, of course, the increased cost of wages will then feed back into the inflation for the hotel. Education decreased primarily as a re uh, due to reduction in costs associated with participating in third level education, as we've already discussed. And then finally, miscellaneous goods and services fell mainly due to reduction in prices for motor insurance premiums. That's another thing that's going to come up again pretty soon health insurance premiums and jewellery, clocks and watches. And this decrease was partially offset by an increase in prices and articles or products for personal care, hairdressing salons, personal grooming establishments, like getting nails done, et cetera, and house insurance premiums. Just remember again, house insurance premiums. Think about that. What's increasing? Back up here, the price of a house. And therefore, if the value of your house goes up, well then the price that you're insuring it for would go up. And therefore, of course, then that would have a further knock-on effect. Now, let's move on then from there. But I do want to point out one thing is that if you, um, I'm just going to stop sharing here for a moment. If you take a look at that CSO release, it constantly shows you one particular graph. I just want to show you CSO inflation. Yeah, here we go. And this isn't, I, I have got this just on the screen where we don't have all the text and everything that accompanies it. So if you go to the full release, that's what I've summarized for you. But just look over here. <clears throat> now, you see here we have the CPI and the HICP. What's the difference between the two? Well, before we get to that, let's just take a look at the graph of inflation in Ireland, October 2021, which of course is 13 months when you take into consideration the, the fact that we have two Octobers, is that all throughout this time frame, as you can see, annual inflation was over 5%. And therefore we can see that the CPI is this one, is this line here. Okay, so it's the blue line. I'll consider that blue anyway. And uh, blue line there. And the latest figure that is at there is 9.2%, which is of course higher than what it was in September at 8.2. However, what is the HICP? What is that? Now again, the CSO has a has an explanation note on that, but I'd rather just pick out two key things and I want to show you them myself. Basically, the CPI is the Irish official Irish measure of inflation in Ireland, but the HICP is the harmonized one. And what this enables us to do as economists is compare inflation rates between member states within the EU. So taking the Irish measure of inflation and comparing it to the Dutch one, Spanish one, French one, Maltese one, um, Lithuanian one, or wherever it might be. You wouldn't do that uh, because then you're not comparing like for like. So then what the EU did <clears throat> is that in 1996, it had agreed that uh, 
it was going to launch then a harmonized one so that then we could take Irish and compare it to Dutch because the Netherlands is in the EU. Take the Irish and compare it to French because the French one is in the EU, etc. And yesterday was Monday. So yesterday morning, as I was driving in to uh, where I was, where I had my first event uh, yesterday, um, as I was driving in, I was listening to the conversation about that the Irish Republic was formed, of course, 1922, which we know, but how it, well, all of the legal agreements and everything that was happening was happening around about this time. So it's interesting, of course, that when you create a new country, ultimately, which is what was done in 1922, you have to create a whole set of economic indicators in it as well. So the first official CPI for the state was actually comp compiled in March 1922, whereas the HICP was launched in 1996, long after we had joined the EU. But what I particularly wanted to show you is two things that I mentioned to watch out for earlier on. There's a couple of things that aren't included in the harmonized index. And one of those is mortgage interest. Remember what I mentioned earlier is that mortgage interest is of course interest on a mortgage. It is a cost of borrowing for a mortgage. So if interest rates go up, mortgage interest goes up. And of course, at the moment, uh, now when I say at the moment, as has happened for the past 20 years, being at the moment, our monetary policy and our interest rate is driven by the ECB rate. But the other one down here is house insurance whether it is the contents or whether it's the house insurance itself of the actual house is distinct to what's in it. They're both in there too. Car insurance, <clears throat> tax, motor tax as well. Whether it's for the car uh, or whether it's for a motorbike. I just paid my dad's yesterday. Uh, God, yesterday was an eventful day, wasn't it? Uh, I just paid dad's tax yesterday. And again, I had noticed that it, it too respectively had gone up, but that will not be, rec that will not be uh, reviewed or taken into consideration in HICP whereas instead in the CPI, it would. So just a couple of, a couple of distinctions. Fundamentally, the reason that there are two is one is to look at the official measure of inflation in Ireland and to compare it to other countries in the EU. Then we have the HICP. And then you can compare uh, like for like. And in order to do that, then certain things are excluded, one of them being mortgage interest, uh, motor tax, and a variety of others. Okay, so moving on now from there, now I want to go from now that we've looked at where inflation comes from, what is the Irish inflation rate at the moment and what is driving Irish inflation? Now let's compare Ireland to the rest of the world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to this time bring you over to the FT tracker. And I'm going to need to minimize this in order to go to that. I'm going to bring you over here to the FT tracker. Okay, so the FT tracker here is from the Financial Times. And as you can see here, it's updated quite a lot, but I just want to show you, this is the main, the main ones. So when we look at the UK, the UK is continuing to rise 11.1%. So remember what I said about inflation being down to 10%? That happened last, this year, it's happened during the summer. It's continued to rise. We can also see the US, the US has turned. We can also see France as well. Uh, France at 6.2% and Japan. Japan has gone from <laughs> inflation that was deflationary, quite significantly deflationary, long after a lot of the developed, other developed economies were inflationary. Uh, so Japan, yeah, I mean, I was watching this. I was watching the, Japan, the Japanese inflation rate for about two years. I was delivering um, an APAC, which is Asia, Asia Pacific, an Asia Pacific economic outlook every quarter for a company in the UK. And I was watching inflation in Japan and I was watching what they were trying to do. And I was, because their interest rates were already super low, but I was looking at, taxes they were trying to put on consumption and all sorts of things trying to make inflation happen in Japan and as you can see now inflation in Japan is 3.8 percent which is the highest level okay admittedly it was up at that level in May 2014 but before that the highest level it had got to in July 2008 was 2.3 percent Japan when I was in college was always the country we looked at that had a really really low economy in the 80s after a property crash that was the country that we were learning about when I was in college that had uh, quantitative easing, which was the, the printing of money by the central bank. And of course, when it came to over here, any country you wanted could have been a case study. The UK, the European Union, the US, Australia. We saw so many countries. When it came to us writing the book about, about quantitative easing, there was no shortage of who we could refer to. As I say, when I was in college, different, different story. 
So as you can see over here, there's a range of inflation is happening everywhere. It's, it's just happening everywhere. And I'm going to bring you to another graphic and now in a moment and you'll see how, how what I mean by everywhere. But there is another source of inflation that I haven't spoken about yet. Now, it is it is uh, reflected in what I've spoken about to you already through demand pull, but particularly cost push, and that is imported inflation. So as a business, in my own case, we do business with UK. Sorry, well, we do, but we do business with US. And over the past year, we have two customers in the US. Over the past year, it has been wonderful doing business in the US when you get paid in dollars because the dollar has strengthened and strengthened and strengthened and strengthened. It was magic because we never had to push up our prices, but we were getting more money because the dollar was strength, 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 strengthening. In August, I went to the States to meet one of those customers and I was there for two weeks. Now, this is then when I'm going to the States. Now, if I'm going to the States, ultimately, every single thing I buy, everything I buy as soon as I land there is imported for me because I am somebody that's based in Ireland. So anything I'm buying, if I am buying dinner, if I'm buying, actually, I bought this here. If I am buying a train ticket, if no matter what I'm buying, as an Irish person, I'm importing goods and services from the US. Now, that wasn't so pretty because then, of course, every single thing that I'm buying, I have to buy at the higher exchange rate, the, the higher um, inflation rate. Sorry, higher exchange rate, the stronger dollar. And that's imported inflation. Now, the reason that I didn't bring this up to you earlier is because that, of course, is a cost which is pushed up. And as a result, then, again, I either absorb that. Now, look, to be doing business with a country for a year in comparison to spending two weeks over there, as you can imagine, it was much better to be doing business for the year as distinct to what I was spending when I was there. But the point I'm making is still the same. Think about anybody who went to Disney this year in Orlando or Los Angeles. They're importing hospitality. They're importing tourism services. Think about anybody buying in goods from the US and selling them there on. Again, they're importing. So if they're importing things at a higher price because of the dollar, well, then, of course, that then pushes up their cost. And you can also see this here, of course, being reflected as well in all of these various economies, too, because the UK economy is 80 percent services, for example, 20 percent products. And I could get a lot more into the UK economy and it would be really interesting to do that. But given the time we have and the job I have to do tonight, we, we don't quite have time. So let me just pop in here. I'm going to take a look at Ireland. <clears throat> And in Ireland, okay, here, if I do this, I'm going to see pretty much very similar graph to what I had seen, what, what I've shown you in, C, in the CSO. This one, of course, goes back to, I remember, I, I remember all of this time. An economist living in Ireland in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12 was extremely interesting, of course, unfortunately for the wrong reasons. But I remember all of this. I remember deflation happening. I remember um, slowing deflation. I remember accelerating inflation. I remember all those things. And then, of course, all that has happened throughout here. So we can see that inflation in Ireland was approaching 5% uh, percent back in December 2007. Uh, the fortunes of the country were going to change uh, around that time. A lot of it had been embedded into the economy at that stage anyway. And as we can see, deflation happened very significant, very steep. And that's a very difficult place to be in, an, in as an economy because um, I got a phone call from the company where I bought the car uh, I was in a traffic jam in Northern Ireland. I'm just thinking back to the time. Anyway, the times are relevant. But the way what, what they were saying is, hi, Susan, listen, we're just letting you know we're going to have a sale on uh, in the garage over the next couple of weeks because we're expecting car prices to go up next year. And if you want to get in early, uh, now would be a good time to do that. That's the type of um, mindset that people go through in an inflationary environment. I better buy now before prices go further. That can be for housing, that can be for oil, that can be for cars, that can be for a couch. But think about what happens with deflation is, I might just put off my expenditure because the price could be lower next month, next week, next year. And of course, if people put off their consumption, well then prices sometimes have to be even lower to encourage people to buy. And then of course that can perpetuate the spiral. So deflation is defla a deflationary spiral, particularly one that was happening like that was very difficult to get out of. But I'm sure lots of you, um, if you go on to study economics in college or at all, in fact, in, in just in general, the Irish and indeed the European debt crisis of 2010 and beyond was a, a, a case study that provided lots of people with lots of, less, lots of lessons. But in here, 
what I can do is I can create my own HCP, C, uh, HICP. So I'm going to put in Ireland, France, Spain, as soon as I can pick up countries in the World Cup, um, Argentina, uh, um, Japan. And okay, the minute I add in Argentina, look what's happened. Is that Argentini, Argentinian inflation is 88%. Okay, there you go. You can see that at the moment, Irish inflation is higher than Spanish inflation, which is higher than French inflation, which is higher than the Japanese. So you pick whatever countries that you want and you can actually see the change in there. If you want an overall global picture, scroll on down to this one. And this here will actually tell us where every country in the map is. Now, the, the really, really good blue ones. So uh, if you pick out Nigeria, I looked at Sudan there earlier, 107%. 107% it means price have doubled in the year to date which is massive, obviously. Um, if we look over here to India, 6.8%. <coughs> India looks very big there now in, in that particular, the way, the way it's looking. China, 2.1%. And the state, 7.7%. Seems very low for China, actually. Um, there's us over here, 9.2%. And you can have a look then at any particular area. But I'm just going to scroll on down and I'm just going to take a look at one more point here which is the inflation forecast for 2023. And I just want to point out the very beginning of this article is summarized, summarizes very succinctly expectations. And that is inflation has started to show signs of easing from the multi-decade highs in our case, 38 years, reached in many countries following Russia's full-scale invasion uh, of, the US, of, the, of Ukraine. The latest figures of the more, most of the world's largest economies still make for worrying reading, which we've looked at, with price pressures remaining high as the war continues to keep energy and food prices elevated. But in some countries, pressures have eased and energy and food wholesale prices have declined. For anyone who's unsure of what food wholesale prices are, let's say I go to Super Value and I buy a jar of um, Indian curry paste. No need for me to like tell you what I was eating for dinner this evening, but let's say that I buy a jar of, of Indian curry paste. That is as a retailer, Sorry, as me, a retail customer buying from a retailer. But of course, super value doesn't buy one or two pots in case I might come in this evening. Is that instead they might buy, they might have a deal where they might buy hundreds of thousands of those pots of Indian curry paste. That's wholesale. So wholesale is when you buy at a much, much, much greater level. And then, of course, that further goes on through the chain. Because when I'm, if I'm buying a jar of Indian curry paste, well, then, of course, Patak, to actually make it, have to buy the spices from the various providers so that they can go into it. All of that is the wholesale market. It's when you're buying much bigger in bulk, as distinct to you and me. So if I just scroll down here, um, you can see down here, this is, it does look like inflation at the moment is what, this is the expectations. And right now, we can see that they are, okay, France, maybe not so much, and Japan, certainly not, but of the others, we can see that the expectation seems to be that um, the expectation is for inflation to temper. And I'll talk to you about why, where, where that's coming from. But so for example, over here in the case of Ireland, we're seeing that that inflation is expected now to begin to decrease. Now, before I get any further, knowing that I'm running, uh, of course, that I'm run, running short on time. And again, please do pop your questions in if you have them. Is that what, what, what has been done about this, right? If we think about what has happened in Ireland, okay, there's been an intervention on the pub, on public transport, right? We're aware of that, as, as I mentioned. The other one is, of course, the energy credit. Is that I got the ES, the electricity bill the other day, and I looked at how much it was. It was one euro twenty two cents in December in Ireland when the heat is on. Of course, obviously, um, that is not the case. That is because the two hundred euro energy credit has been taken off the bill. So that is a, what they call a universal energy target, no matter what household in the country, no matter how much, how many people live in it, no matter how much people earn in any of those households, it's the same thing. Everybody gets that energy credit. My mom and dad at home in Cork, they live in a house. It doesn't matter what size the house is. It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter how much they're earning. It doesn't matter anything. Everybody gets that energy credit. And that is another target measure on the part of the government. Now, that is what has been happening, let's say, at a fiscal level. And this is what we have been seeing various different countries doing to deal with the cost of living along the way. I also mentioned the other one for businesses paying staff. The 
Uh, I remember back when you could only get a 250 euro voucher tax free to give to your to give to your staff. Then it went up to 500 euro, particularly because uh, the government said, look, in light of all that had happened during COVID, and in light of all of the uncertainty and the difficulties that we faced, and in light of everything that we had asked our staff to do around that time frame, we're now going to increase it to 500. And now this year it's gone up to 1,000. That's another fiscal measure. All of those are interventions on the part of the government. And any of you that looked at what happened during the budget in 2023, the budget for 2023, there's a range of measures. And I could go on here, I could talk about the change in the tax brackets and so on like that. But that's fiscal. Let's look at monetary policy. And this is, uh, I got this from weforum.org. This is up to October, how central banks have been handling inflation. So what do you do as a central bank? What do you do? Well, the three tools are in your book and they are, you can increase interest rates. You can try to strengthen your exchange rate. You can decrease the monetary supply. You can decrease the amount of money that's out there. So as you can see, most of countries in the world have increased their interest rates. Some of them have increased them very, very significantly. Look at New Zealand, for example. New Zealand is up at the highest of them. Now, there's a term we use in monetary policy called a hawk and a dove. And a hawk, hawkish monetary policy, is when you take action that can have a particularly strong effect. Or it's where you see, you know, maybe moderate inflation and you take action anyway. So hawkish moves would be when you'd increase interest rates, even if, you know, inflation is moderate or you might increase interest rates at a higher level than expected. Then dovish, this is what you're seeing down here in Japan. Dovish is when you do the opposite, is when you leave inflation run more, let's say, than, the, than, um, than others might. And that's why you see here that this is described as central banks in the 10 big developed economies <laughs> have raised rates by a combined 2,040 basis points. Now, that really doesn't mean anything. That means when you just combine all of the interest rates across various different countries and add them all together, it's an, you know, it, it's it's a it's an academic number. It doesn't actually mean anything necessarily. In this cycle to date, with Japan being the holdout dove, dove being it has the lowest interest rate, um, based on the most recent data that is in in this uh, infographic. So we can see here we've got New Zealand, US, then Canada, Australia, Norway, UK, Sweden, eurozone, because of course Ireland doesn't affect or influence its own interest rate. That comes from the ECB, Switzerland and Japan. Japan still being, um, at that stage, it was under, as we say, underwater, under uh, under 0%. So what is the theory behind this? Okay, well, let me explain this now. And of course, when we were writing the book, guys, I'm telling you, this is the way in which the world used to work, is that if you can increase interest rates, not if you can, if you choose to, as, as, a, as a central bank. If you increase interest rates, then what happens is that you slow down the economy. So what you're doing is you're decreasing the attractiveness of borrowing because you want to make it more expensive. So you're, you're decreasing the amount maybe that people might borrow to buy a house or you're, you're slowing down the amount that people might borrow in order to do up their house. Or, and then of course that's that. Now this is where there's a fiscal contradiction because of course we're trying to encourage people to insulate their house at the same time. But let's let's take um, as they as we say in economics, let's keep all things equal. So you're slowing things down. You're slowing down investment, and when you slow down investment, of course, then you're slowing down the marginal propensity to consume, and then that slows down consumption. And then that increases, of course, the other thing you're doing is by increasing interest rates, you're increasing the relative attractiveness of savings. So by increasing the attractiveness of savings, again, you're slowing down consumption. And the idea is then, is that then the, the economy has to react by decreasing prices to encourage more consumption to happen again, to encourage more people to spend, etc. So the idea here is that as you slow down the economy, is that prices fall as well. The issue that's happening at the moment is, going back to Ursula van der Leyen, is that this time a lot of this has been driven by a war that is continuing. It is being driven by the fact that if I decided not to buy a loaf of bread in one supermarket in Dublin, 
and I simply cross the road and I go to another supermarket in Dublin, it's easy for me to swap my consumption. Super quick. I could walk across the road or I could drive two miles across the city. Even if I, and I grew up in rural Ireland, if I was to say, right, I'm not going to buy a loaf of bread in Ballin College in Cork, instead I'm going to go to McCrow. Or I went to college in Galway. If I say, right, I'm not going to go to Ballin Slow for such and such thing, instead I'm going to go to Athlone. I could do that. You could swap your consumption really quickly. That is an environment where you've almost perfect competition or you've very, very close substitutes. You can't just switch on another gas pipeline. You can't just, like I say, say, right, look, let's just create a, a wind farm there um, two miles across outside of Dublin or two miles into the IRC. You can't do it that quickly. And uh, as if you, any of you read that State of the Union address, and I did, interesting reading for a range of reasons. But one of the things in particular that the EU now wants to focus on is hydrogen power, for example. You can't just switch that off. And that is why we're seeing these really, really demand pull pressures. That's what's happening. So yes, we're seeing central banks increase interest rates. Yes, we're seeing that feed into inflation itself. But that is the way in which this theoretically is supposed to work. And remember, all these central banks have objectives. The ECB, keep inflation at or below 2%. The UK, Bank of England, same thing. In the, in the case of the Fed, they have two. They have to manage price at the price level or inflation as well as full employment. So they have objectives and they can't just stand idly by. Now, whether they're as effective as a result of what we're seeing, well, of course, that's a whole other debate. And the last thing I want to finish up with in the last minute that I have with you is this is just, I just want to go down to expectations. Is that in? It is expected that from now, inflation would look like it is falling. That's not to say prices will stop rising. I need to stress that point. Inflation is the rate at which prices rise. So while we might see here a decline in expectations around what inflation might be, that might that still implies that prices would go up, but just at a slower pace. Like we don't see any here leading into deflation. So just to, to make that point. So on that note, and uh, I am now perfectly on time, I want to thank you all very much for being here. As I mentioned, we will be sending out the recording and uh, we will take care of that as soon as we possibly can. My name is Susan Hayes Cullerton. Of course, please feel free to send me any message afterwards if you want to check in with me. I'm at Susan Hayes Cullerton on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm pretty much on most things. So please do feel free to, uh, to do that. Thank you so much indeed for spending the time here with me, whether you're watching me live tonight, uh, Tuesday the 6th of December, or whether you're looking at the recording. And of course, I will uh, see you all in the new year with a new webinar. I know exactly what it's going to be and everything else. And we'll share the details with you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Christmas and I'll talk to you next year. Bye.